I'm Debbie Homfeld. Welcome to my garden. I want to talk to you today about container gardening. It's something that a lot of us do for a variety of reasons. A lot of times it's a, a space constraint if you're gardening on a patio or a balcony. Um, sometimes a container really works well for you. For me here in Brookswood, I garden under these great big trees. So containers are a great way for me to control um, who gets the nutrients, who gets the water. So I do that a lot. One of the first considerations for a container gardener is what kind of container. I want to talk about the three different types that I use primarily. I use a lot of plastic pots and I know you're thinking, oh plastic, oh so cheap, so tacky. No, not anymore. There's a lot of really good plastic finishes. Um, I do like ones that aren't shiny. I kind of like a matte finish because to me it looks more natural in my garden. The plus sides to plastic, definitely price. Um, for me, portability. They aren't great huge heavy pots that I put my back out every time I shift them around. And selection. There's just a lot of great choices in shape. So this one is um, what we call a bowl shape. So it's not as tall as it is broad. Um, I have a lovely big black plastic one there, very structural, very um, modern in its design. Also good one. And of course, um, oh, this one, the black one here, is sort of a very traditional pot shape. So all of those are available, reasonably priced, and they're easy to store. If you don't have the luxury of keeping your pots with soil in them over the winter, plastic you can empty out, you can stack them up and store them. So. But talking about wintering them, the plastic does winter very well. Um, the majority of my pots stay out in the garden all year round. Plastic um, is, is a really good alternative that way. They bleach in the sun, keep that in mind. So that's my plastic ones. Next we come to, uh, I don't know, creme de la creme, um, the heavy glazed um, pottery pots. They are, they are lovely. They can be expensive. They are heavy. So um, once you've got them where they're going to be, you know, <laughs> get help, put your back out or don't plan on moving them. Um, when you're looking at a pottery pot, you want to look at a heavy pottery by the best quality you can afford in a pottery pot because they will last forever if you get a good one. These ones are made in Vietnam and for whatever reason, I don't know if it has to do with the firing process or the clay they use, they are the most frost resistant that I have found. There's a couple of good lines out there, um, no sponsorship at all here. These particular ones I buy in a set of three um, graduated sizes at London Drugs. They have them most every spring. They're a fabulous price and they fill my garden. I've got lots of this type. Um, yeah, so, so heavy, a little bit more expensive, but really durable. Really going to last for quite a long time. And I've got a couple of other selections uh, just down in the front here. That's those ones. The other type of pots that I use, um, not as often, but I have some that I really quite like, are fiberglass. Fiberglass are kind of the middleman, so they're not quite as light as plastic and they're not nearly as heavy as the pottery. The downside to the fiberglass for me is um, I have had occasions where they've, uh, where they've chipped, which pottery will too, um, and had occasions where the finish of uh, the outer layer has flaked off, um, which pottery will do if you don't get good pottery. But sometimes I find a, a fiberglass pot that is a shape I want or it's or it was a good price and so so I pick it up. Um, my fiberglass ones that have been in the garden for years and years, I do find over time um, the the finish flakes off. So if it's someplace in my garden where that aesthetic is, I can turn it, it'll hide it and my plants are happy in that pot, that's what we do. So three different types of pots. Probably the most important thing when you're looking at any kind of container to garden in is the drainage. So, one of my favorites. You always want to look at the bottom of a pot and make sure it has decent drainage in it or that you can put decent drainage into it. It's, it's really important that our, our plants and containers don't get waterlogged. So we want to water them enough and retain the moisture, but if they sit in standing water, it literally will drown them and Nobody wants that unless you're planting a pond. So good drainage. Now, I found a pot. 
it's got a good drainage hole or maybe it's plastic and I know I can drill a drainage hole into it. Next thing I want to do is I want to cover the drainage hole. I know that sounds kind of productive, but I don't want the soil and mud when I water my pot running out over my patio, my balcony and annoying my neighbors. So I use this piece of mesh. I think it was somebody's curtain at one time. This works really well. The other thing that I use is um, the coir mat that is left from my um, coir hanging baskets that I do from year to year. Eventually it kind of breaks down a bit. I can pull that out and use a piece of that. But to tell you the truth, any fabric that you have that is um, a big enough weave that water will run through it will be sufficient to stop the soil running out of your pot. So that's the next thing we'll look at is drainage. Now we've got a great pot, we made sure it has good drainage. Now we need to put soil in it. So, oh, again, no affiliation whatsoever, but this particular sea soil blend is one that I like for my containers. It is OMRI listed. That means that it is organic and it has passed the certifications for that. It is a good container um, mix. It will hold water, which we want. We want it to be able to hold some moisture, but it also is free draining. So it doesn't pack and, and, and really make a, a mass. And again, organic has some really good natural um, fertilizers into it because it is a composted fish and bark product at its base. So one of my choices. Now, you don't have to, um, it's one of, my, one of my favorite choices, but it might be a little bit more expensive. There are some inexpensive container soils. By all means, if you're doing up just a cheerful pot from the patio, um, we're not looking for longevity year after year, you can buy a less expensive soil and, and just enjoy it. So again, comes down to comes down to budget and um, but like the pots, the better quality you get, the better and longer lasting your results might be. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing, when you're choosing your plants, it's easy to go into the nursery and be, oh my goodness, look at all this variety, look at all this color, I want one of these, one of those, one of those. You need to consider where your plants are gonna go. They all have specific needs, like us. Um, and on their tags, let's find a tag here that's got some good info on it. Oh, here, let's do this. Okay, so on your tags, there will almost always, a good, a good um, plant always has, it will say exposure. Um, exposure means how much light it wants. So this guy is a Cascadia petunia. He wants full sun. It says that right on here. So I want to put, I want to consider where my pot's going to go. This one's going to go on my front step full sun. I want to put like with like. So all of the plants that go into this container need to be ones that will want that same exposure, that same bright full sun. This container that I'm planting up is going to be part sun. So it doesn't get necessarily hot sun all afternoon. It gets morning sun um, and it gets partial afternoon sun. So this one I'm going to plant up with those things in mind. Every container that I plant, I work on a basis of three. That's the starting point, and then I always add more. But I want a thriller, something that's going to be big and kind of striking and architectural. I want a filler, something that is going to mass the middle, is gonna give me um, a good, good coverage and hopefully um, color. And then I want a spiller. I want something that's going to soften the edge of the pot. So I want something that's going to trail over and really extend the length of, of foliage and interest in my pot. This particular pot, because I know where it's going, I have my thriller, which is a dragon wing begonia, one of my favorites, sun or shade, blooms all summer. I just can't say enough about them. This is a perennial. This is a dwarf goat's beard. Um, again, this is a pot that lives out of my year, in my garden all year. This is Creeping Jenny. Um, Creeping Jenny sounds like a nice girl. Um, <laughs> she's not. She wants to own the world. Creeping Jenny goes in my containers and anytime it wants to creep out into my yard, I'm ruthless and I pull it out because it can be quite invasive. So keep that in mind. Into this pot, I'm also going to add some leaf lettuce. Now leaf lettuce says it wants full sun, but I know from experience that full sun, too hot, the leaves scorch and they go over quite a, quite a bit faster. So 
I'm okay with putting this one. I'm, I'm breaking the rules, read the tags, follow the tags. This one I know from experience I can put in part sun and still enjoy some nice, nice leaf, leaf lettuce bits tucked in the front of my planter and I feel very virtuous because I'm growing my own food. So there's that one. Um, this one, this is a full sun pot. This one I just want to pop of cheerful color by my front door. So I'm using for my um, thriller, I am using purple fountain grass, fantasium. I love it. I love the movement it gives. We used to use Dracaena spikes and, and they're really kind of stiff and formal and that's not what my garden's about. So this one has great movement in the wind. It gets lovely plumes um, that are kind of fuzzy and interesting later on in the year. That's going to be my thriller. My fillers I am using um, a little white pot mum. So it's a chrysanthemum, but they're forced. They're grown, this is far earlier than chrysanthemums would normally grow. But if I keep it deadheaded, if I keep taking off the spent blooms, this will give me bloom for most of the summer, almost all the summer. This little guy, I love this. This is celiosa. Celiosa used to be, um, they were in, in red and orange and they were very stiff and I don't know, my grandma grew them. They just weren't my favorite. The new colors and the new shapes I think are so fun. This one I really love. I love that pop. And same thing, the blooms last a long time. But as these top blooms are spent, I don't know if you can see, there's more little blooms coming up along here. So as this top one is spent and over, I'm going to pinch it out and let these little guys come up and, and do their thing. So there's my second, because you know, if you could do two fillers, why not? Uh, <laughs> this is going to be my spiller. This is a little um, petunia, um, a cascadia, this one's called. I liked the color that it was going to give and I think it's going to soften the edge of the pot nicely. With petunias, the larger the bloom, the more you're going to have to deadhead, the more the care they're going to make. When we talk about deadheading, I don't mean just take off the petals. You need to actually take off at the tip, the base of the flower, that's where the seed head would be formed. With an annual, so a plant that only lives for one year, once they've produced their seeds, their job is done and the rest of the plant just languishes. If I keep deadheading it, um, I'm basically saying, no, you're not done. You've got another month and you, you know, keep, keep producing flowers. So deadheading, the larger the petunia flower, the more deadheading it's going to need. The little tiny flowered ones, the calibratia, which I'm sure I have one around here somewhere. I can't put my hands right now. Oh, wait, 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 I do. Okay, this is more the calibratia style. Smaller leaf, a um, little more um, sprawly habit, smaller flower. This one, I might pick the flowers off because the flowers are big, but it's not as essential for the blooming as it is with the bigger ones. So, that's my petunias. This pot, I am planting up for full sun high drama. So I've gone with a very architectural pot. I'm going to add to it this lovely calla. Love this for the um, very elegant shape of the flower. I also love this one for the variegated leaves. So when I've got this, it's not just the flower. Always consider your foliage as well. The, the flowers might be in a, a state of, okay, I'm just regenerating. Your foliage needs to be able to carry the day to a certain extent. So that's going to be my thriller. I'm going to add to this one, again, because I want to feel virtuous. I'm adding to this fern leaf dill. Fern leaf dill wants full sun. Same as my pot that I'm putting up here. It will get fairly tall and it's going to give me, as the name implies, fern leaf, it's going to give me this wonderful frothy foliage. So I'm going to plant it kind of back here. So I'll have the wonderful texture and froth of the dill. I've got the architectural shape from the cow flowers and leaves. I think it's going to be a great contrast. So he's going to go in there. I'm going to, for one of my spillers, I'm going to use a couple of them on this one. I'm going to use a lantana. Um, lantana are fabulous. They are um, very heat resistant. If you keep them deadheaded, they will literally bloom all summer long. They are inclined to have um, a sprawly habit. I use them in my hanging baskets and I love them in my containers for that very thing. They're going to soften the edge. So that's one of the spillers I'm going to use. I'm going to use, this is a, a new petunia. This one's called Midnight Sun, or Midnight Glow, pardon me. Again, I love that it picks up my yellow. It's quite dramatic. It's going to suit this pot quite nicely, I think. Um, it's going to give me both a bit of my fill 
and the spill. It's going to do both. It's going to kind of trail over. So that's what's going in there. The other thing that I'm putting in this pot for fill to give me kind of a, a, a little bit more um, volume, I'm actually going to add basil to it. Um, basil is a, a wonderful herb you can grow very easily. It likes full sun, no doubt about that one. Um, it likes regular water, so keep that in mind. Um, and as with most herbs, when you're going to harvest your basil, you want to pinch the tips out. So rather than removing this whole stem down to the base, which now that's it, uh, that, that stem is done. Nothing more coming from that one. Very cheap. There it is. If you pinch the tip out, so instead of taking the full thing, I'm going to leave a, a, a set of leaves at the bottom. I've just taken the tip. It will branch out and it'll send a whole nother start there. So keep that in mind when you're um, harvesting the herbs. Inside. The other spiller I'm going to put in here is this one. I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. Dachondria. Um, my grandma called it licorice plant. I don't know why. It has a lovely kind of a silvery leaf. Um, almost a velvety look to it. So again, I'm going for that contrast in shape of leaf, in texture of leaf, and I think this is this is going to be a pretty high dramatic pot. So, so that's that one. Um, water, you really have to keep them watered. You are uh, limiting them, your plants, from getting to any other surface water. You're in charge of water. Make sure you don't let them down. Okay, I think that's it for today. Thank you for um, coming and sharing my garden with me. I hope we'll see you again. Bye.